Welcome to our session on working with land trusts and partners outside the trail community to save national trails. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please type it in the chat box. We've saved about 25 minutes at the end of our session today, uh, which we hope will be uh, for a dialogue with you about how to save national trails. Um, I will ask, uh, actually, I am not able to advance my slide and I'm not sure why. And Don, I, I don't know that we have a screen share from you yet. There we go. All right. You have a screen share from me now? Yep, and it's showing the, your whole desktop in the editing, editing space. So we'll want to start the show there. Um, so I should yep. set up show? I just play from the start. Play from the start. Here we go. OK. Yep. So. Here, here's, uh, here are my co-presenters today. Uh, Mark Hickton is the director of the Dane County Land and Water Resources Department. Joel Dunn, uh, president and CEO of the Chesapeake Conservancy. Ann Sense is the landscape partnership manager for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And then R.G. Absher is a board member and past president of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. Uh, Dunn, we are getting just a little bit of feedback. Okay. Um, and how do I address that? Uh, you sound better now. It sounds like uh, the papers again. Okay. Um, and then I'm Don Owen. Um, and this is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll be talking, I think each of our presentations will come back to this common theme, uh, which I refer to as the Tom Sawyer approach to uh, saving trails. Um, I think most of us have heard uh, Mark Twain's story about making uh, Aunt Polly about Aunt Polly making Tom Sawyer uh, whitewash uh, the picket fence around the house as a punishment for some juvenile mischief that he got into with uh, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, Huckleberry Finn. Um, and Tom, being the uh, enterprising young man that he was, um, instead of uh, making a chore out of it, made it look like fun. And not only did he get all of his friends to paint the picket fence for him, they paid him for the privilege. And I think we can use this same approach when it comes to saving national trails. We have incredible, incredibly precious resources um, that we are charged with protecting. And I think we'll find that we have lots of friends out there when it comes to protecting them. Um, there are people in every town and every community along a national scenic or national historic trail. There are preservation organizations, there are land trusts, um, there are agencies, and what we'll be talking about is how to partner and work with those land trusts and other partners of all shapes and sizes to protect important lands and resources along our national scenic and national historic trails. We'll be paying particular attention to land trusts. Um, they're natural sister organizations for us. They have the same basic mission in mind when it comes to protecting and conserving uh, lands and resources. Um, we'll also be talking about other agencies and other trail organizations. Uh, Native American tribes, local governments, and even Department of Defense agencies can help protect land for national scenic and national historic trails. So with that, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Laura Hicklin, uh, and each of us has a story to tell you about protecting national scenic and national historic trails by working with partners outside the trail community. Laura, uh, it's all yours. And if you just let me know when to advance slides. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. I have selected a background picture today taken from campsite number 55 at Potawatomi State Park along the Eastern terminus of the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. I am going to start us off today with a bad play on words. You heard it here first. We are protecting lands for trails, partners working together to protect land. This word smash was inspired by a strategic planning session that I'm sure many of you here can relate to. We were going through the standard SWOT analysis, but every issue ended up as both an opportunity and a challenge. 
So we merged the list to, into one and called it Chopportunities, AKA Challenging Opportunities. So let's go ahead and talk about how to take advantage of Chopportunities to Partect Trail Corridors. Uh, one thing I like to do when I work on the Ice Age Trail is to focus on how the trail fits into our local community. I really love that the Ice Age Trail starts and ends in Wisconsin, and that fact helps me connect with my partners. Not every trail needs to be the Pacific Crest or the Appalachian Trail, and I think it can be overwhelming for partners to contemplate how their tiny piece of the world relates to more iconic spaces in the national system. So find something relatively small and modest about your trail that will get local partners excited and start there. Next slide, please. So this slide is a little background on how the Ice Age Trail Corridor came to be in Dane County, Wisconsin. We've been actively planning the corridor since the 1980s, and it was officially adopted into our local park plan in 1990. We were fortunate to have an open space referendum in 2000 that created annual funding for all of our acquisition goals. And I want to emphasize that we've intentionally structured our plans and budgets to take advantage of acquisition opportunities as they arise, and we do not segregate or hold funding for specific projects. There's definitely a tendency for advocates to hold onto resources tightly, but I want to encourage you to let them be used for any outdoor recreation project, knowing that future resources will follow. Um, I included this picture on the slide to draw attention to another strategy that we use to protect lands for the trail. We are incredibly open to sharing the corridor with other compatible recreational uses. The strategy has shifted over time and we believe that we get more support for the Ice Age Trail and a more diverse user group if we allow for multiple uses. This picture shows a property that was purchased for the Ice Age Trail, but we also worked hard to preserve the remnant farmstead, which has turned into out to be an incredibly popular attraction. And we also allow for public hunting, which is not a use that we would have been open to in the past. So I think this point in particular is really helpful as you think about partnering with land trusts or local uni units of government. You know, what uses are they interested in seeing on their land? And can you find a way for projects to support both their uses and also your trail goals? Next slide, please. This is a quick slide that shows the extent of our trail plan in 1990. You can faintly see the Ice Age Trail running north-south on the western side of the county, and you can see a few other bicycle pedestrian trails scattered about. Next slide, please. This is what our trail plan looks like today. We radically have expanded our network, and we've made a lot of progress in protecting lands for the Ice Age Trail. Incorporating the Ice Age Trail into our local park and open space plan is the single most important factor that has made the Ice Age Trail successful in Dane County. I encourage anyone that wants to see their trail succeed to focus more on convincing their local municipality and local land trust to invest in the trail and less time hoping that the federal government will be able to do it. I love our federal partners and I'm grateful whenever the Park Service and others can put time into the project, but for us here in Dane County, um, working locally is where we've seen the most progress for our trail. Um, seeing projects that are identified in local plans will also help generate buy-in from your local land trust because they know that that plan has gone through a public process. And please do not worry when plans show multiple trail projects, they will definitely not compete against each other. Success on one trail creates momentum for other trail projects. Next slide, please. I've listed the most common Ice Age Trail partners in our community, and I don't think there's an acquisition that occurs without involvement from at least two of these partners, but more often than not, it is three. Uh, we are lucky here in Wisconsin, we have several land trusts that have been accredited by the Land Trust Alliance, thanks in large part to Gathering Waters Conservancy that's active throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, so I have a lot of confidence in my land trust partners knowing that they have gone through that accreditation process. I have not listed one of our most important partners for the trail, however, and they are the landowners in your trail corridor. If you can identify landowners that are willing to donate or sell their land for the trail, you are going to be successful. 
and you need to be thoughtful on how to engage with landowners when the trail is up for discussion in local park plans. So while I'm encouraging you to get your trail in a local plan, I think that's really important. You also need to be thoughtful about like, what are landowners seeing? What are landowners hearing? Are they intimidated or threatened when they see their property on a, on a public map? And so we spend a lot of time here kind of working with landowners to help them understand that our plans are just plans. Um, and we also go out of our way to make sure that we do not identify project areas that follow uh, ownership boundaries. So we might pick a natural resource feature, a river corridor, um, an elevation point, so anything but an ownership boundary when we're, when we're showing our trail corridor uh, on a public map. I think that's a really quick way to turn landowners off is if they feel that their individual property is being targeted. Next slide, please. So I titled this slide working with a local unit of government, but I think that the lessons also apply to working with land trusts. My number one piece of advice to get partners involved in your project is to fit your trail goals into their existing goals. So don't ask them to change their goals to accommodate your plan. Uh, spend some time understanding the mission and purpose of, of the land trust or whatever partner agency that you've targeted and figure out how you can convince them that your trail plan fits within their existing goals. Um, one example would be you know, a land trust focused on food security might get really excited about partnering with you to find a property that can support both a community garden and a trail segment. Um, so you'll probably, you probably have already noticed during this discussion that I'm definitely not a purist. I, I love, um, especially in more rural areas when we can identify corridors just for a trail. Um, but a lot of, especially here in Dane County, we're in a kind of quasi, developed um, more urban settings. So in that, in that situation, I think being open to sharing the corridor with um, compatible recreational uses is really important. Um, my other big piece of advice on this slide is to have a strategy to engage with both staff and elected officials or board members. I think you need to reach out to both groups. But my experience has been that you're more successful starting um, with paid staff if the land trust has paid staff before you go to the board of directors or to an elected body. So your paid staff people are gonna be on the ground every day. Um, board members aren't going to be as engaged and it can be frustrating for staff to see things kind of filter down to them from the board. So certainly you need to think about your board strategy, but also if there, are, if there are paid staff, make sure that you're connecting with them. And then another, another um, piece of advice is to think carefully about what you're asking your partner to provide you. So um, we will often have discussions and people are trying to figure out how an organizational land trust can partner and I, I watch advocates like pepper the land trust with questions like, well, what is your budget and how do you do this? And, and instead, instead of recognizing that they're already asking the land trust to make a contribution and so taxing that entity to provide a lot of detail and background information can be, can be frustrating. So make sure that you're doing your homework um, and that, that you've researched their, their mission rather than asking them to provide it to you. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is uh, titled Dream, and this is, this is the vision that you know, many trail advocates start with. It's a, it's a beautiful map, and it's a photo of restored lands, and I think that having documentation like this when you're working with your partners is incredibly important, and there's definitely a place for it. Um, but I think that conversations with partners and landowners are often more successful when you start with a different approach. Next slide, please. And this is what I call reality. So a lot of times local partners and landowners want to focus on what they are experiencing in their community today, not your vision for the future. And again, I'm, I think there is a place for the vision and the discussion, but I think it can be overwhelming 
to see, you know, this this perfect future if if they've got really um, big local immediate frustrations. Um, so in the example that I'm showing here, I was working with a landowner that was a farmer, um, and he really wanted to talk about celebrating his family's agricultural history. And he wanted to talk about his concern about the competing residential development to the east, which you can see on that map. Um, there's a pretty stark line between what's happening to the east with development and then uh, the farmland to the west. And he he was really turned off to the Ice Age Trail initially um, when, when the Park Service and others really focused uh, their discussions with him about their vision for his property. So they, they kind of started with that, that dream slide that I showed earlier, which is nice, um, but that threat, that was a threat to him just as the development to the east was a threat for him because it was a change um, that he wasn't initially, it was a change, excuse me, that he wasn't initiating. So eventually he did come around to realize that he could celebrate his family's agricultural history and youth. Um, by supporting the Ice Age Trail, but we really had to let him lead that vision and, um, and direct that conversation. And today we do have um, an easement on his property that allows for him to continue in agriculture and we are also able to locate the Ice Age Trail. Next slide, please. Um, so please remember to be patient. Um, all of the projects that were shown on this map were identified in our plan starting in 1990. And you can see that most of the work we did uh, didn't occur until the 2000s. Um, we were in conversations with landowners for many years before some of the trans transactions came together. And I think that's another mistake that many of us often make. We start talking to a landowner and a partner gets excited and we see that someone has funding available. And so we ask them to, to freeze and lock it up. And then it turns out that the landowner wasn't quite ready, something else happened and, and those funds sat there. So I'm a really big believer in spending money and letting the success of each acquisition build upon itself. And, and you, will, you will be able to tap into additional resources. And the best way to get more resources for your trail are to spend the resources that you have available today. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just a bit of good news to end on. Um, this was a recent press conference showing a 300 acre acquisition for the Ice Age Trail that was recently announced. Um, the person missing for this, from this picture is our biggest Ice Age Trail advocate in Dane County, Gary Warner. Gary is the retired executive director of the partnership. And I want to end by thanking Gary for all of his work and support to make national scenic trails throughout our country a reality. Thank you. Well done. Um, this is Joel Dunn. I'll, I'll dive in next here. And Laura, that was a fantastic presentation. And um, I'm really impressed by your progress. Thank you. Um, so I'm the president and CEO of the Chesapeake Conservancy. And I was lucky enough to participate in a webinar with um, Chief Ann Richardson from the Rappahannock tribe earlier um, in this conference. So I'll, I'll um, abbreviate some of the background information here, but I just want to say that Conservancy has been involved in the creation and support of the management of the Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail since its very beginning. Pat Noonan, the founder of the Conservation Fund, um, had a vision for this trail and I was lucky enough to work with him to help establish the trail. Um, we've founded the Chesapeake Conservancy to support the National Park Service's management of it. So we are a cooperating organization with them. The purposes of the trail are to commemorate the exploratory voyages of John Smith and the Chesapeake, also share the knowledge about American Indian societies and cultures, and interpret the natural history of the Bay. And of course, to get people out and learn to love the Bay as much as others do, like me. <laughs> Um, we've worked really closely with the National Park Service to advance these goals. And um, one of the ways we've done that, next slide, please, Don, 
is we've helped develop a conservation strategy for the trail. Um, you know, when the trail was established, it was a 3,000 mile long um, trail following Smith's routes of exploration in the Chesapeake, which is basically every major tributary there you can see in the map on the right. Um, so we needed a framework for really prioritizing conservation projects in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we came up with this plan working with the, Na the National Park Service really led this effort and the Conservancy supported it along with the trails federally designated advisory council, which has since sunset. And um, the, it has several purposes. One is to define the trails most important resources in their locations. Um, based on the trails comprehensive management plan, set out a consistent approach for assessing trail resources and their needs, encourage local state and federal partners to protect trail resources as a part of a broader land conservation effort and provide guidelines for implementing conservation through collaborative actions at the National Park Service and others. So in short, this strategy is a means for defining priorities um, relative to the trail and designing appropriate conservation methods. So we um, were very fortunate that the timing of the completion of this plan and um, the Obama administration's first term coincided together. Next slide, please. And we, um, we really prioritized, um, this is a, a map from 2018, but we really started this in I think 2013. Um, we pulled together all of our partners from across the watershed, federal, state, land trusts, um, county governments in some instances, to really identify some priority areas for conservation um, along the trail, but a little bit more broadly in the Chesapeake Bay region. And ultimately for land management agencies, the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, all submitted projects in the form of a collaborative landscape proposal, which we called the Rivers of the Chesapeake. And we did this for four or five years running. Um, next slide, please. We, we, in addition to, oh, this is a close up on one of those areas. This is the Rappahannock River, you know, Phones Cliffs is in the middle of this. This is kind of you know, complementing the discussion that we had earlier this week. But you know, we really went through and prioritized parcel by parcel using GIS and the knowledge we have in our network of partners. Next slide, please. We then um, got letters of support for our initiative, you know, uh, 56 letters in total, House members, senators, governors, um, speakers of the Maryland and Virginia House, Indian tribes, nonprofits, you name it. Um, we got everybody to write the administration letters urging them to prioritize these projects in our landscape. In the end, um, that was pretty successful. Next slide. This is just a kind of a quick snapshot, but um, our partners, our land conservation partners like the Conservation Fund, um, Open Space Institute, the Nature Conservancy, lots of uh, land trusts too from across the watershed help protect some really critical places across the watershed like Werewakamako, which is one of the most important Native American sites in the Chesapeake or even on the East Coast. Um, Phones Cliffs, which was featured earlier this week, areas in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, James River National Wildlife Refuge. We expanded the George Washington and Thomas Jefferson Forest by 4,700 acres. We're, um, we've actually protected some land along the Potomac uh, with BLM support through um, um, Northern Virginia Conservation Trust, which is a small land trust. And so this has been pretty successful. This relied, of course, on federal money. And that, that was cool. It was a really great way to coordinate our community. It was you know, a pool of capital that everybody could um, rally around. And, and we were able to get some successes. We've done a lot of work that's complementary to this, but, but through our state conservation programs or private conservation funding. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you know, oh, one last point on the, um, the federal funds is the Great American Outdoors Act. Hopefully we'll support more projects like this where we all come together to identify priorities and we're able to garner um, political and uh, administrative support for those acquisitions. Next slide. 
Um, we, we have also though thought more broadly about um, conservation sources, funding sources and priorities in the watershed. So at the same time we were doing that trail plan, um, the National Park Service Chesapeake Office and the Chesapeake Conservancy helped pull together the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. This is a large landscape conservation planning framework that brings together state and federal and nonprofit partners into um, a, a collaborative where we foster action to conserve culturally and ecologically important landscapes for the benefit of people, economies, and nature throughout our entire 64,000 square mile watershed. We're really focused on defending existing funding sources, expanding them, or creating new ones, such as leveraging private capital or uh, mitigation funding so that we can protect shared priority areas. And we also focus on sharing strategies that work. So we produced this report that's in the, on the left of the slide here about marking milestones, and um, I'll send around a link to that. But this highlights um, 18 projects from across the watershed in 2018 that were successful and the different methodologies that were used to do it. So I guess, you know, in terms of how to engage partners, the, you know, the trail provides you with a nice framework. You can obviously um, rally all of the federal agencies together to collaborate and the state agencies like we did on Rivers of the Chesapeake. But I think it's really important also to think more broadly about the things our partners need in the watershed. So rather than come to them and say, hey, I got a great trail, I need your help. Um, the first question should be, you know, what do you guys need in order to be more successful in your work? How can we help you um, to, to protect or expand those resources for your work and build a relationship where you're enhancing their ability to do to accomplish their priorities and through that relationship grow these opportunities to get joint victories along the trail. And I have lots of examples of this. We've been very fortunate to have wonderful partnerships throughout the watershed. Um, for example, on the Nanticoke River, which is one of my favorite rivers in the Chesapeake Bay, um, we've had a private foundation provide us with $3 million over the last several years to seed conservation projects or support ongoing ones along the river, which happens to be along the trail. And so we've protected over 2,700 acres of land. Some of them are on the water for kayak access. Some of them are a little bit off the water that protect biodiversity. The Department of Defense has been a big supporter and has matched all of the money that we've put in to the projects. And all of the local land trusts in one way or another have participated as well as national land trusts um, have participated in projects along that river corridor. It's been a really exciting um, project and, and, and um, a great example of how to draw your partners into your work along the trail, but also to facilitate their needs and their work by generating additional resources and data that they might be able to use. Just one word on data. Um, we built a, a conservation innovation program at the Conservancy to facilitate knowledge because we believe knowledge is power. And then we provided that data and knowledge to all of our partners for free. Now that was supported by the EPA Chesapeake Bay program, which is one of the oldest and most successful restoration efforts in the world. So you can't ignore how important it is to be mindful of um, other ongoing ecosystem-wide restoration projects in your landscape because there's inevitably overlap and things that can benefit both your trail and the ecosystem restoration projects that are ongoing. Um, I'm, I know I'm running out of time here. So next slide, Don. I wanted to mention that our conservation partnership has been focused on um, protecting 30% of our watershed. We've There's a big global commitment to protecting 30% of the planet by 2030, followed by um, following on EO Wilson's call to protect 50% of the planet by 2050. And um, we're really proud that we've protected 22% of our watershed so far, as this pie chart shows. We've got 8% to go before 2030, so we've got a lot of work to do. But um, you know, together, as a larger community, we have been very successful in protecting Maryland's program open space, which has been fully funded for three years in a row, um, over $100 million a year. 
um, Virginia's um, easement program, which is uh, extremely successful and um, has been uh, protecting uh, or has protected hundreds of thousands of acres of land. That's the Virginia Land Preservation Tax Credit, Pennsylvania's Keystone Fund, Delaware's Open Space Program. All those programs collectively are providing a lot more money for land conservation than the federal agencies or federal programs. So we've been very focused on supporting those state level programs and coordinating closely with those state agency staffers um, just so that we know what their priorities are, they know what our priorities are, and we um, help support them and defend them um, and come up with new ideas to expand the impact of their programs, certainly highlight the, the successes that they've had. Last slide, uh, Don. Our new, next initiative um, that we're focused on is creating a Chesapeake National Recreation Area. We feel that Chesapeake's a national treasure, but it doesn't have a a National Park Service unit designation. Um, the trail is not a unit. And so we're very focused in, on the early stages of creating a national recreation area, which will hopefully make um, the Chesapeake more inclusive for all of our diverse communities and create a permanent toehold for the Park Service in the Chesapeake that complements the trail. We really want the trail to knit together these special sites um, in the Chesapeake and in the Chesapeake National Recreation Area. And we think that this will further add to the network of supporting infrastructure for conservation in the Chesapeake and along the Chesapeake Trail. Um, so with that, I'm going to cede the floor. I wanted to thank Don for this opportunity, and I'm really excited to hear the other presenters. Uh, and next, Ann Sense will talk about the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and how they've become a, a key player in a um, a movement, uh, uh, a regional conservation partnerships movement, which has um, started in New England, but has grown to the extent that there are about 50 uh, regional conservation partnerships uh, extending from Virginia to Maine along the East Coast. And the Appalachian Trail uh, amazingly knits them all together. So I'll turn things over to Ann Sense. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you virtually today. Uh, I'm Ann Sense. I work for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, specifically in our conservation department, where I assist in managing the Appalachian Trail Landscape Partnership. And shout out to Joel, who told you a little bit about the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. Um, the AT Landscape Partnership holds up this Chesapeake group as a model for us in many areas. So um, it was so great, Joel, to hear you talk about uh, this partnership. Um, so I'm speaking to you from the Martinsburg, West Virginia area, which is in the Eastern Panhandle of the state, about an hour and a half away from DC. Um, although I'm in West Virginia, I thought I would set the mood, so to speak, with a beautiful fall scene of the Bigelow Mountains in Maine. Um, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend a visit when travel is safe again. Uh, next, okay, that's good, that's the right slide. Um, so when we talk about landscape conservation in the context of the Appalachian Trail, we like to give a nod to Benton Mackay. Some of you might be familiar with him, but if you aren't, he is the visionary behind this famous footpath. Um, in fact, fun fact, next year, we will celebrate 100 years of And I think we may have lost you. Don, it does look like we just lost connection with Ann there. This is Liz. Do you want to um, answer some of the questions that have popped up, or do you want to move on to the next speaker and then fit Ann in?
I'm happy to answer some questions if you, if you want to do that, or we can advance to the next uh, presenter and come back later when she gets back online. Okay. Um, let's let's take a few questions right now if we can. Would you like me to read them? Yes, please. Um, we have had great. This is from Richard Lutz, Buckeye Trail Association. We've had had great success on own along with our state partners and large nonprofit partners like the Nature Conservancy, but less success with our county and smaller land trusts. Do you have any good selling points to get them on board and buy into the goal of a protected trail corridor? corridor? Um, I'll, I'll uh, pass to Joel to start, but I have a few thoughts I'll add on at the, mo at the end. Um, and Laura, you're certainly welcome to weigh in as well. Um, sure, and Richard, uh, thanks for your question. Um, so I had the same kind of experience <laughs> and you know, I walk into the room and say, hey, I got a great idea, I got a great trail, it's so cool. And these smaller um, county and land trusts are like, whoa, 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 we got our hands full with what we're dealing with now. These are our priorities. Like. That, that's great. So one of the ways that I found to help get around that is to bring money to the table. I know that I know that's awfully uh, brutal in terms of a perspective. Um, and one of my mentors once said, money first, partner second, conservation third, <laughs> which again is really difficult to accept, because, especially as someone who loves the land and wants to protect the land. But um, having an eye towards a seed funder would be a great strategy because when you come to the table and say to a county or a smaller land trust, hey, um, I know you're doing some projects in this area and along this corridor, um, you know, does this area interest you? Can I interest you in a 50% match or something like that? It changes the game, you know, it really reorients people and creates a shared win so, you know, I've been, we've been very lucky to have this funder called the Mount Cuba Center. They're actually in Delaware and they only fund within a hundred mile radius of their, um, their center. So I don't know if it's applicable to most partners on the call, but there are major foundations and individuals out there that understand that sometimes you have to um, seed projects along your priority geography in order to bring partners to the table. And um, another way we did that was with the DOD in the creation of a Sentinel landscape in the Chesapeake where the DOD is effectively offered to provide 50% of the funding for these acquisitions. They essentially pay for the easement value um, on these acquisitions. And that has really changed the game with these land trusts and county governments. I mean. Um, we did one here in Annapolis at one of our most famous parks where the Navy put a million dollars into the project. Um, and it, it, really, it really changed the tone and tenor of the discussion with the county. They were a lot more interested because they got a lot more value for their dollar. So um, when you can find a federal, state, or private philanthropic program that complements um, you know, the county or smaller land trusts, I think that it's a great strategy to help bring them in to, to your, um, your partnership and your network. Laura, would you like to add anything? Oops. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I agree with everything that Joel mentioned. I think that's great, great advice. And I would even back it up a step further and um, we we try to get partners invested in our project areas without asking for money initially and so we kind of lead with the concept that if we can get um a trail corridor or another project boundary identified in a plan that it that it helps with state federal or other grant opportunities and so that's usually our first request is we don't lead with asking the county or the smaller land trust to fund a project. We just ask for them to um, identify the project in, in their plans and thereby making the project more eligible for grant dollars. And then from there, we can usually build momentum over time. 
And, and I'll just add one thing that, that, that uh, we found um, uh, incredibly effective. Um, there are a um, number, there are 1400 land trusts across the country. Uh, 450 of them are accredited um, and they do have their own missions. Um, but one of the things, particularly with donated easements that land trusts are seeking uh, is they are seeking what's called a conservation value. Um, and with a national scenic or national historic trail, you have a gold star conservation value. You have something that the Internal Revenue Service can never challenge as a conservation value. You have something that gives extra oomph to the um, acquisition of any parcel of land or any easement to protect a piece of, uh, a piece of property. Um, and writing those into um, the uh, conservation easement or deed of, uh, for a fee transaction just adds to the stature of the transaction. Um, do we have Ann back or is she still um, uh, trying to connect? I'm back, Don. <laughs> okay. Would you like to take over? Sure. I apologize, y'all. It wouldn't be a virtual presentation without someone losing internet connectivity, and that just happened to be me. So I apologize. Um, so Don or RG, if I could get you to go back to the slide of Benton, I just want to finish that thought really quickly. Thanks. Um, so just to recap, when we talk about landscape conservation in the context of the Appalachian Trail, we like to give a nod to Benton Mackay. Um, some of you might be familiar with him, but if, he, if you aren't, he is the visionary behind his famous footpath. Um, there's this great quote by Mackay that I love where he describes his vision as not merely a trail, but a realm. Um, I'm not so sure that a realm is the best word to use to describe the Appalachian Trail today, but the point is, the point that Mackay was making and the point that I like to emphasize is that the Appalachian Trail wasn't meant to be an isolated footpath in the woods. Um, you all likely feel this in your relationship to your own trails too, right? Whether they go through woods or not. Um, when you talk about trails, you talk about the recreational experience, sure, but you also talk about things like community connections, historic values, the appreciation of natural beauty and our natural resources. Um, I could go on and on, but in short, the experience that we want people to have on a trail is one that is really big, an experience that doesn't just remain in the woods, so to speak, but that is an experience that inspires and that creates a visual, emotional, and psychological connection to something that is larger than ourselves. Um, so just circling back to Mackay's vision to ensure that the Appalachian Trail remains a place for people to have that inspirational experience, that larger than life feel, we have to broaden the way that we think about the Appalachian Trail and its conservation. And that's where landscape conservation and these regional conservation partnerships come into play. We have to think on a larger scale that transcends that traditional boundaries and traditional partnerships to protect all the values that make our trails so special. Uh, next slide, please. And to continue setting the stage for you today, I want to remind you of what the Appalachian National Scenic Trail looks like on a map. On the left, you can see that red line, which runs from Springer Mountain in Georgia all the way to Katahdin and Baxter State Park in Maine. And along the trail's 2,190-ish miles, it connects major national parks like the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina and Tennessee, um, like Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. And it also connects national forests like George Washington and Jefferson National Forest and the Green and White Mountains. And it also connects a variety of state parks and forests. It goes without saying that there are a lot of different people from a variety of agencies involved in managing this footpath. And to really get into what it means to protect that skinny red line you see on the map, you have to further consider the map on the right. You see that purplish line, it looks purple on my screen anyway, um, that line is outlined by a larger black line. Um, there are a lot of ways to define the Appalachian Trail landscape, but one definition that we've settled on for the time being is what falls within that black line. That's a watershed boundary called the Huck 10, and it consists of about 27 million acres. 
Of course, not all that land within the watershed boundary can be protected. A percentage of it is already developed, of course, and that is okay. That's totally okay. Once again, I'm just going to ask you to think big and consider how the Appalachian Trail impacts the land within that watershed boundary and vice versa. That's really powerful when it comes to opportunities. All right, next slide. So to move it into the regional conservation partnership portion, um, I hope it, I made it clear that as the ATC enters the second century of Appalachian Trail management, we are thinking about the trail on a big, broad scale. To achieve this vision of connectivity in a conserved Appalachian Trail landscape, ATC cannot do that alone. We're having to think outside the box. And one thing that Don alluded to that I want to emphasize today is how ATC relies heavily on a variety of partners across both public and private sectors. Those partner groups include something called Regional Conservation Partnerships, or RCPs. There are three things that I, I bolded on this slide that define RCPs that I want you to take note of. Um, those are diverse partners, collaboration, and a shared vision. Those are three ingredients to a regional conservation partnership that are crucial to its success. If one is missing, it's likely that the conservation partnership won't succeed. We can move to the next slide. What you're seeing here is a map of RCPs across the Appalachian Trail. Um, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy didn't form these RCPs, but we do have strong relationships with all of them in one way or another. In some cases, we provide funding in the form of mini grants to assist these RCPs as they build up capacity to accomplish their conservation goals. And in other cases, we provide time and expertise on leadership committees or at various gatherings and or conferences. We devote these resources to these RCPs because we believe in their efforts and we have seen what collaborative conservation can accomplish on the ground. In most cases, these RCPs use the Appalachian Trail in their communications and marketing materials as an iconic piece of the region, and they want to protect it based on that region's unique values. The relationship that we have with these RCPs is vital to protecting the larger, larger Appalachian Trail landscape. Next slide. And one RCP that I want to draw your attention to today is called the Heart of Maryland Conservation Alliance, which is a relatively new regional conservation partnership. It's actually the first one in uh, Maryland, which is really exciting to see it get off the ground. So Heart of Maryland is led by a local land trust called Catoctin Land Trust, and they recognize the values that this special region has. And it also recognized that population growth poses a serious threat to those values. So the Heart of Maryland emerged as an alliance or an informal network that includes a variety of groups coming together to protect the region's recreational assets, its history, its agricultural lands, which are very important in this region, and more. So you can see on this slide a variety of partner names. You can see land trusts represented as well as groups who prioritize different values based on their respective missions, like the heart of the Civil War heritage area who has an interest in this portion of the Maryland landscape for historical reasons. Next slide. Regional conservation partnerships are a collaborative conservation vision. And that's especially important in a time where we have to think across county and state lines to achieve our conservation goals. So on this slide, you can see the heart of Maryland's vision, which is one that is rooted in the protection of the area's natural resources, because that in turn enriches the quality of life of all residents and visitors. So the way that Heart of Maryland accomplishes its vision is very similar to how the ATC works to accomplish its large landscape conservation vision. It is collaborative work that's rooted in the development and strengthening of diverse relationships, which can lead ideally to regional solutions or national solutions to conserving important land and waters. This work also includes the promotion of an iconic place because of its variety of values which is a value-centric approach, 
that allows for greater recognition of the natural resources that so many of us can take for granted. So the bottom line, and this is a simple one, RCPs like the Heart of Maryland are a powerful voice for conservation because more can be accomplished when we are working together. And we can move to the next slide. It looks like we may have lost uh, um, Anne's signal again. Um, and so I'll take over for a moment since actually I was uh, uh, involved in this um, project uh, along with Ron Tipton and a number of other people. Uh, this was uh, one of the early slides that we put together when we started talking about the Heart of Maryland Conservation Alliance. Um, the Appalachian Trail follows the uh, county boundary between Washington and Frederick counties, and it provided almost a perfect um, uh, opportunity for people to work together. Um, uh, and lands had been protected by uh, the uh, state of Maryland, Department of Natural Resources, and by the Appalachian Trail along the uh, uh, ridgeline of South Mountain. Um, which uh, also is the border between the two counties. Um, but if you hike that section uh, of the Appalachian Trail, you're very conscious of the fact that the corridor of land that you are walking within is very narrow um, and that uh, the um, land uses adjacent to the Appalachian Trail um, have a significant effect upon uh, what that trail environment really feels like. Um, the Heart of Maryland Conservation Alliance has taken this South Mountain opportunity, uh, South Mountain Ridge Line, as its first opportunity uh, for everyone to work together. Um, and so many conservation values come together on this mountain uh, that everybody has a vested interest in it. Um, I'll turn things back over to Anne if she's back on the line. doesn't look like Anne is uh, back quite yet. Okay. Um, then I will just wrap things up with her last slide and then turn things over to RG. Um, uh, the Wild East program uh, for the Appalachian Trail uh, takes advantage of all these uh, regional conservation partnerships um, and is, is making uh, the impact of the Appalachian Trail bigger and stronger and broader than we ever envisioned. Uh, and with that, I'll introduce uh, R.G. Absher, who will talk about the Overmountain Victory Trail's work uh, with land trusts and other organizations to uh, conserve the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> I'd like to begin talking about the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. We just entered the 40th anniversary of the designation of the trail, which took place back in 1980, and that was the 200th anniversary of the uh, campaign to uh, Kings Mountain during the American Revolutionary War. The Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail is 33, 330 miles in length, and today roughly one, th almost one third of that, uh, a little over 90 miles, is uh, on the ground as protected uh, Overmountain Victory uh, Trail, with the rest being on the uh, uh, corridor and uh, motor route trails, uh, portions of trail. But the, this next slide, but the National Park Service has, has been working with the OVTA, the Overmountain Victory Trail Association, the last few years to develop master plans uh, to identify landowners along this 330 mile stretch and where potential easements could be obtained to get additional trail, trail protection on the ground sections over mountain Victory Trail established. Uh, the OVTA has been working for the series of task agreements, working with the local communities and encouraging them to put skin in the game, to partner with the National Park Service and with the OVTA to make all this happen. Today's presentation will be a case study on locally how we, we're doing that. Next slide. <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about the Yadkin River Greenway system, which is in Western North Carolina. It kind of lies, just looking at the map here, it lies almost halfway between the towns of Winston-Salem, North Carolina and Boone, North Carolina. 
It's along the Yadkin River uh, and Valley in North Carolina with the Eastern Trailhead being east of this, if you look at the map, over in Elkin, North Carolina. The Yadkin River Greenway, next slide, uh, began in 1990s uh, with a vision by a local doctor that took a canoe trip down the river. And he said, wouldn't it be great to have a greenway system? And come to find out in the conversation that this was part of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. And so it began a long term partnership uh, between the Greenway and with the uh, National Park Service. Uh, involved uh, today, there's about nine miles out of the potential for 13 miles along this route that are now part of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail for the large part. Next slide. And there's a lot of Tom Sawyer scenarios, as Don pointed out, in working with trails. You know, you have your trail volunteers, you have your community uh, action folks, uh, you have uh, businesses, and you have one that we're going to focus in on uh, quite a bit today, eas easement holders, uh, volunteers who volunteer easements for that are many times private and business landowners adjacent to the, uh, through the trail system. Next slide. So we're going to look at some tools to make all this happen. And one is establishing interagency agreements using the letter of intent, working with volunteer easements uh, for landowners who are with landowners, ex expanding effective partnerships with other organization. And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about utilizing interpretation and education to promote awareness and interest. Next slide. The letter in of intent is a, an effective tool to get you toward, towards an easement. And when you basically can have that conversation with the landowner and get them on board uh, and they see that it's a good thing, uh, then you, you can go ahead and get the intent of that down on paper while you're waiting for the easement process to work so that it can, it can be recorded onto the deed that will be uh, result in permanent protection of, of the land where the trail crosses that, that property owner. Next slide. So partnering with other organizations at all levels, and I'll be emphasizing this throughout through the local level, the regional level, to the national level is key at, with our trail system as it is with other trail systems, I'm sure across the country. Next slide. Just uh, west of Yadkin River Greenway, just a couple of miles up the road is a, a Corps of Engineer Reservoir, W. Carr Scott Dam and Reservoir. And then the early, around 2002, EMBA, uh, with the trail super each trail care crew team came and did a trail building workshop uh, to build sustainable mountain bike trails at Car Scott Reservoir that just also likewise happened to be along the stretches the over mountain victory trail next slide. The Corps wanted to make sure that the trails were uh, wide enough to accommodate pedestrian uh, as well as cross country runners as well as the mountain bikers in order to uh, buy into the the concept of building a sustainable trail. Uh, there's an early picture of myself in there on, on the left side with the uh, orange hat on and a little bit darker gray, uh, or darker hair than, than I have today uh, back, back on that particular workshop. Most memorable because I was working with the Corps of Engineers at the time, got to see this become a re reality. But today they have over 40 miles of trail. A large portion of that is on the OVNHT. Next slide. And back to the Atkin River Greenway, one piece of cooperation, a partnership that makes it work is that we work with uh, the local municipalities. We're involved with two towns, uh, the town of North Wilkesboro and the town of Wilkesboro, North Carolina and the county of Wilkes. And these interagency agreements provide for uh, maintenance and law enforcement along the stretch of the trail through these sections. Next slide. A particular nice success story we had was working with land that was formerly leased by a skeet shooting club. And the landowner decided that they wanted to uh, preserve the history. When they found out that this was a location here was uh, an 18th century campsite of the Over Mountain Man. And this is a, an original remnant trail. The Over Mountain Man actually walked very close to this little route through here of the Greenway. And it was actually, it's hard to tell from looking at the photograph, but it's, it's real close to downtown uh, North Wilkesboro. And the Greenway connector, once this was done, what it achieved was 
access to the downtown shopping district, access to urban residential housing, AD access accessibility through paved trail system, access to two municipal parks in the area, and access to a YMCA facility and a physical therapy facility. Next slide. Many times you're working with engineering uh, obstacles when you're working with greenway systems, especially along streams and so forth. And the businesses were fairly close to the, to the shoulder of the river, so we didn't have a lot of room to work with. At the same time, you have to be really careful with environmental and the permitting process. In our, our case, the permits, principal permittee, permitter is the state of North Carolina, Department of Natural Resources. Next slide. We were working with seven uh, landowners through this particular half mile stretch through this location, including the skeet club that, that I mentioned, uh, a former skeet, skeet club me, uh, member, landowner, but we're working with businesses. And obviously you have a safety issue with a, a trail system and the public going through the back of your work areas, your garages and body shops and car washes and things like that. So uh, we had to, work with the landowner to see what they wanted to try to achieve some win-wins. Next slide. And here's an example where we had a very non-aesthetic fence uh, that was located to some of these businesses. And so we worked with the landowner to see what they wanted. Uh, next slide. and uh, put in some privacy fencing and some safety barriers uh, to keep people from falling in or riding their bikes in the river along the greenway section. Next slide. Another uh, way of, of a creative partnership that was employed here was working the state of North Carolina, water resources, Department of Natural Resources, uh, which we call, refer to as Diener in North Carolina. We had, uh, and you can see shown on the left is a ditch. This was a stormwater discharge ditch. We worked with the state to turn it into a, a, a mitigation area, uh, a wetlands area uh, with plantings and so forth to reduce soil erosion. Same time, we were able to leverage a $200,000 grant to uh, help aid with the construction of the Greenway. Next slide. And a, and a bridge, a pedestrian bridge across the previous stormwater discharge uh, ditch, as it was, was called. Next slide. So the end result was preserving a, a section of the trail that was there, uh, and the over mountain man walked to the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1780. Uh, and that was recently, recently done right prior to the 40 years anniversary of the uh, of the designation of Over Mountain Victory National Historic Trail, a long time coming, but by working with landowners, we're able to achieve this objective and have a tremendous success story along the stretch. Next slide. We we'll wrap up today with interpretation and how that is used to help achieve uh, trail protection. The OVTA, another one of our partners, uh, each year. Uh, reaches about 50,000 people. Lar large, large portion of those are school students with its annual March to Kings Mountain. Next slide. And with its interpretive programming, uh, it's able to bring the visitor out and, and connect with the trail and its history up close. Next slide. Uh, Freeman Tilden, the father of interpretation, once said uh, a little rhyme that I actually like and think about a lot and correlates interpretation and its importance and ability to try to win people over to uh, trail protection. It goes something like this, through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, through appreciation, protection. Next slide. So working with many agencies and, and with landowners uh, with through the master planning process that I mentioned earlier, and then identifying who those landowners are and then bringing it up close 
uh, and try to achieve some win-wins seems to be uh, the, some of the keys to the success story of this local case study. Next slide. And we think about it in three different levels of success, um, local level, regional level, and national level. Next slide. So it's going to segue us over to the question and answer series that are coming in, I see on chat, which is really, really great. Uh, I'll sort of kick out off a couple of discussion questions uh, uh, next, next slide. So here we go. Uh, what questions do you have for any of our panel members today? What caught your attention specifically? So you can ask it, uh, any of the folk here, Laura, Joel, Ann, or myself, or Don. Don, you want to take it from here? You're on mute, I think. Um, I'll actually ask Liz if uh, there are any uh, questions in the chat box, and we'll start there. Lots of great questions. Um, so I'm I'm doing them in the order they were received. Um, so from the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, there's a question to Laura. Um, great presentation. Um, what advice do you have to initially engage private landowners who may want to tell their story, protect their land, and find common ground with a trail when the landowner may initially be resistant to public access and government efforts? Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, this is something I've definitely experienced um, quite quite a bit, and I... I want to emphasize that I do not, and I, I do do a lot of our acquisition work. It's kind of the program um, that I came up through. I am a real estate bro broker, and I, I do not ever lie to a landowner, but I most definitely present the side of myself that I think is going to relate to them the most. Um, so as a government agent, I go out of my way to offer to meet with them on weekends or in the evenings, and I find it's really helpful if you if you just do something as simple as finding time when they're not at their jobs to meet with them. So you need to be free in the evenings, you need to be free on the weekends, um, particularly with someone who is resistant to public access and government ownership. Um, I do not drive up to their property in a government vehicle. I do not, um, this is a little silly, but I, I don't drive a Prius to their property. I won't drive a Subaru to their property. I might borrow someone's pickup truck if I'm meeting with a farmer. Um, I make an effort to uh, connect with, with all of the landowners. So if there's a spouse, I try to always have um, both both parts of that relationship at all at at the table. Um, I also try to engage with adult children if that's an option and just find ways to connect with all of the family members. Typically the, the family member that's most outspoken or, or represents the family doesn't necessarily represent all of the viewpoints. Um, I will often try to connect the, the landowner with someone I've worked with previously who I know had similar feelings when they started the process. I've had a lot of landowners that, you know, chose not to work with us because of private um, property concerns, but I've also had some that, that started with that concern, and by the end of the process, they were really happy. They, they made the deal work, and I've not ever had anyone regret um, making the sale to, to us. And so I try to play matchmaker and have uh, a new landowner connect with someone we've already worked with. Uh, I do not ever show up at a property with a map that has a line drawn through it because you're gonna end up drawing a line uh, right through their favorite hunting spot or you know some other feature that you don't know about. So I make sure I spend a lot of time understanding what they like about the property and how they use it before I introduce the topic of, of public access. And then finally, we do pre-pandemic, we do occasionally host um, landowner lunches or dinners where we try to connect with the local community center and we invite people to come out and talk. And again, we don't lead with, with our vision for the trail and the beautiful maps. 
uh, of you know protected or restored lands. We talk about what we think are the community values, which tend to be uh, the agricultural history or impacts from urban development. And then we find a way to tie that those themes into um, preservation and how preservation for the trail actually helps the landowner deal with some of the other challenges that they that they are facing. That's that's a great answer, Laura. Um, and I would just like to emphasize how important it is. Uh, uh, neighbors talk to neighbors, um, and having uh, one landowner who uh, has a good relationship uh, with a uh, the trail organization and or the trail agency um, can make all the difference in the world um, in getting the next parcel of land. Um, one other thing I'll point out is that um, land changes hands. Uh, land changes hands um, on average every several, seven years. Um, and so a property will come up for sale sometime during uh, the next uh, decade or two decades. Um, uh, uh, rural lands change hands every 10 to 14 years. And when that for sale sign goes up, that is a prime opportunity uh, to be there and, and make your pitch. Um, uh, Joel, Ann, RG, do you have anything else to add? I'll just chime in. I thought that was an excellent answer, but I and um, really great observations and care about approaching a landowner with a map and all that. I mean, it's just brilliant. Um, the only thing I'll add is we've really focused on leveraging partnerships. Um, so the Conservancy is relatively small. We're relatively new. Um, some of these land trusts have been there for decades, and they've been developing those personal relationships with those landowners that are, it's just, enormously valuable. And so we've really, um, we've really focused on leveraging networks of networks. So I have a personal network, my organization has a network, our partners have a network, the individuals within that organization have a network. And so we've really tried to leverage those relationships in a way that are most advantageous to accomplishing the bigger picture goal. Sometimes we have to market what we're doing a little bit differently. You know, my uh, mentor, Pat Noonan, used to say, bait the hook to suit the fish. <laughs> um, and that strategy obviously has worked really well for him and, and it's working well for us. But um, I really do think that leveraging your network and your partner's networks is vitally important. And so, so think about, you know, um, how you can... Um, develop or or uh, build relationships based upon people's previous investment of multiple decades. Um, before before we uh, um, do uh, uh, respond to uh, have each of us respond to this question, um, let me just ask Liz real quickly: How many questions do we have in the chat box? Because um, we only have about ten to twelve minutes left. I'd like to get to There's every... about eight, eight questions, one of which has been answered online. Um, Ron Tipton asked something of Joel, who responded in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So I can direct people to that question. Um, Let's go to the next question then. The next question um, is uh, from Kaleo in Hawaii. Um, okay. Here in Hawaii, we also depend um, more on state and county funds to preserve lands and sites. How can we get our federal agency, federal partners like the National Park Service to make land acquisition more of a priority and also to consult with their partner organization to determine priorities? That is a great question. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's always a challenge. And I guess the way I pursue um, land protection is to act like water and follow the path of the least resistance, uh, work with the uh, uh, organizations and agencies that uh, step up to the plate um, and, and make the partnership as broad and as wide and as deep as you can. Um, I understand that the National Park Service and 
uh, the Forest Service sometimes are, are, are uh, reluctant to step into the uh, into a leadership role in land acquisition. Uh, it's uh, a, a difference. Uh, 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 there is a difference between being a trail administrator and and a uh, trail on the on the ground trail manager. Um, but I'd work with uh, the partnerships that that uh, present themselves. Um, that would and then leave the. Uh, relationships or the opportunities that are still on the table uh, for working with the National Park Service or Forest Service. Um, any other thoughts from the uh, from the panel? Uh, yeah. yeah, I had to, uh, just one idea. We we found some non-traditional partners on the Over Mountain Victory Trail uh, down around South Carolina state line uh, in Polk County. We've come across a vineyard and they actually named themselves the Over Mountain Vineyard. We're partnered with them for a stretch of Greenway uh, there, and they even came up with a wine, the Over Mountain wine, and so forth. So the non-traditional partners may emerge and opportunities through the growth of such uh, ventures as ecotourism, this heritage tourism. Uh, we've partnered with the state of North Carolina at Lake James State Park uh, to get some on-the-ground sections of trail and state park lands to look for potential uh, easements of other kinds, of uh, utility easements whatever else might be available out there. And that's that's the beauty of a master planning process and inventories to see what you got and what the possibilities are. So you, you do know what, what doors to knock on. Yeah, and, and I would say actually, Kaleo, uh, that uh, you and uh, Keone Fox and uh, the Alakakai Trail Association have a, a classic example that you can use to teach us. Um, uh, we did a case study on the uh, protection of 2,317 acres by the Alakakai Trail Association and its partners. Um, and if the if there if uh, if a uh, partner is not uh, in a position to step up to the plate and and um, uh, protect land, um, that's why we have partnerships so that other partners can. Um, can we have the next question, Liz? Sure. Um, this one's from Margaret Gorski. Um, what advice would you give a trail that is limited capacity and a board that may turn over fairly frequently to sustain the continuity that it takes to carry out an acquisition program that takes years to implement? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I would hope that you have, uh, um, you, you have members of the board that uh, do have some longevity um, and that you have someone with a deep and abiding commitment to the permanent protection um, of your trail. Um, that's the only way this gets done. Uh, sometimes these deals take years, uh, sometimes even decades. And having somebody who's willing to commit to the long game is what makes the difference. I, I'd agree with that, Don. I, I wrote a couple things in the chat too, which I'll just quickly highlight. One was solid governance for your institution. Um, and that means including diversity on your board. I think that's very important to having longevity. Um, diversity of thought, diversity of race, diversity of gender, diversity of age, all aspects of that. And a system for maintaining um, the institutional um, you know, uh, support. So then sustainable and diverse funding streams are so important. Political support locally, regionally, nationally, having data to back up what you're saying and doing. And then the most important thing though, is just to never give up. <laughs> Be that person who just never gives up. Like on Phones Cliffs, you know, Joe McCauley, my colleague's been working on that project for 20 years. <laughs> And I've been working on it with him for oh, 11 now. So we just never give up. And you can't underestimate how valuable it is to just keep going, keep trying to find a way. Um, that's probably the most important thing. But all those other institutional supports are vital as well. Next question, please. Yeah, I'm working on that one. Uh, we have several questions somewhat related to easements. Um, so, uh, so from Donna, Criddle, excuse my pronunciation, Criddle, Criddlebell. Um, 
We're, I work for a regional land trust and have asked about trail protection. They say it's difficult. Any thoughts on what are the most complicated aspects from a conservation easement standpoint? Uh, the land trust is more interested in protecting scenic qualities or if it overlaps with priority watersheds, other priorities. I think that the, the first challenge um, is one of deciding um, what interests need to be acquired uh, to protect the trail. Um, if you're looking to provide public access, uh, you either need a, a fee interest in the property or you need a right of way. And there are hybrid um, conservation easements slash rights of way. There are a number of ways uh, to approach that. You can have a right of way easement that it is uh, adjoined by a conservation easement. You can actually have a conservation easement that allows a, has, allows a right of public access within a specified width um, uh, through the middle or the edge of a conservation easement. Um, Joel, uh, Ann, RG, uh, do you have uh, other suggestions? Well, connected to that, I, I see a, a similar question was asked about the volunteer easements. Uh, how, how protective are they? Uh, once you get a landowner to sign the easement agreement, it is a permanent land easement, and it goes with the deed, wherever uh, when the land transferred, that instrument is attached to the deed from place to place. So it does allow for protection of the, of the trail from which the easement uh, is on. I'll just chime in to say that um, we do a variety of um, structured conservation projects with our partners. Some of them are fee simple acquisitions for state agencies. Some of them are easements where the landowner keeps, you know, part of the rights. Um, there's, there's like um, different projects along the trail that work. So sometimes say along the Nanticoke River, we really wanna, we're working on a really cool kayak launch site right now with the local land trust in Sussex County. Um, and that's really important for public access. We really, we're, it's a complicated deal and we're structuring it. Other ones across the river are just view shed essentially easements that, that we don't necessarily need the public access requirement on. So I think, I think you wanna keep an open mind with your la local land trusts about different structures for different projects and how you can really be creative um, in, in structuring these deals along the trail. One last thing that I just point out is that um, uh, the uh, outdoor recreation is one of the four conservation values of a conservation easement. Um, by providing for outdoor recreation and public access, um, you are um, actually providing for one of the uh, uh, key uh, conservation values as uh, outlined in the uh, Internal Revenue Code. Um, other thoughts or should we move on to the next question? I think um, we're almost ready for closing, but in, in order to answer, um, we have one more related question. I would invite other folks on the call. Um, there was a question from Margaret Gorski. Are there any trail organizations that do the job of monitoring conservation easements? Several people answered in the chat. I invite you all, if, if you are doing that, put it in the chat and we can capture that. And then I guess um, we should turn it over to RG for closing. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, close this out then. I like, would like to thank all the presenters for today that uh, presented and thank everybody for attending too. We've, had, we've been looking at the attendance throughout the workshop and it's been pretty good. Uh, I'd like to remind folks to fill out the session evaluation forms.